one of the questions that people ask is, hey, what about memory? You better be preserving the memory. If the memory isn't there, then you're not you. What is memory? Well, it looks like a core component of long-term memory, not necessarily short-term memory, which I suspect does indeed go away, but a core component of long-term memory involves physical changes in synapses, physical changes that won't go away if you cryopreserve. The atoms are still there, the molecules are there, still there, the tissue structures are still there. There is no reason, given our current understanding of how long-term memory works, to believe that this process of cryopreservation, especially if it's carried out under reasonably good conditions, would somehow erase all of this structural information to the extent that it would be impossible to recover, impossible to infer. So that's um, one of the, the core ideas. And now we get to uh, a straightforward question, which is, hey, you know, do you want to do it or not? How do you evaluate it? How do you think about that decision? And there would seem to be one of two possibilities. Either it works or it doesn't. And they're one of two choices. Either you sign up or you don't. Now, this leads to a payoff matrix with four possible outcomes. I maintain three of those outcomes are boring. <laughs> the third one, if you sign up and it works, that's interesting. That one will let you wake up in this very good future. So the question, which do you want? Do you want to join the control group or the experimental group? We have excellent data on the control group. <laughs> We're still looking to see what happens with the experimental group. And I have to confess, I think that the experimental group, most of them, are going to do pretty well. Not everyone is interested in cryonics. There are a number of issues floating around. One of them is illustrated by Shirley MacLaine, who said, everyone who has died and told me about it has said it's terrific. So some, if you assign a positive value to dying, then you will not be interested in cryonics, even if you have a guarantee that it works. Well, if all of this pans out, you wake up at some time in the future, you get to see the future, there will be advanced technology. There will be advanced technology because in order to wake up, there has to be advanced technology or you won't wake up, right? So it's, there's going to be advanced technology, there's going to be nanomedicine, and you're going to have a long and healthy life. Believe me, the medical technology that's required to make this whole thing work is going to be able to keep you alive and healthy for a good long time, and you'll be able to enjoy whatever the, the amazing things are in the future, whether it's having dinner and watching the moons of Jupiter, or simply enjoying the amazing technology, or the really good movies, that are presumably going to be available in the future, you'll be able to have a good time. That's it. Wow. Um, we're going to have questions. I just want to say, I don't know about Lots anybody else in the audience, but I look forward to 100 years from now seeing a smackdown between a cryonified you and a vitrified Greg Fahey <laughs> to see who wins. Both of us, I hope. Yeah, I, I do too. Uh, all right, we have, oh, hang on one second. We have Stephen Coles. Yeah. Yesterday at lunchtime, we discussed something called the glass transition temperature, mm -hmm. and going below it involves cracking, mm -hmm. and staying slightly above it, you might not have that problem, mm -hmm. uh, but the metabolic rate at that temperature might be somewhat different from liquid nitrogen. What is the trade-off in your view on these uh, issues? Okay, so the question here is, if you are in liquid nitrogen, when you cool, we know there are fractures. We know that because we carefully monitored to see if there would be fractures and found, yes, there are fracturing events. The fracturing events seem to occur as you go below the glass transition temperature. And as you go below the glass transition temperature, you get a buildup of stress that cannot be relieved because if you're below the glass transition temperature, it's, it's, it's a glass. It doesn't you know, move around and accommodate stress. When you have a sufficient buildup of stress, there is a fracture. Now, in terms of reversible 
technology today, having a fracture is a problem because when you cool and you warm, there's a fracture and things don't work. If you're talking about repair at low temperature using nanotechnology, a fracture is just another form of damage which could be repaired by any of you know, the, the various techniques we're looking at. And if you think about it, the fracture does not cause information loss. In other words, if you have a piece of glass and you break it, uh, the surfaces don't destroy the information in the glass. And equally, if you have fractures at low temperature in, say, your brain, you don't lose information. But it certainly means that you should not warm the patient up just using today's technology. Now, the interesting issue is what temperature should you select if you're going for something which is not liquid nitrogen. And if you want to have what's called intermediate temperature storage, you want to be somewhere in the vicinity of the glass transition temperature. And now we get into some delicate points. Uh, Greg, do you want to comment on the various trade-offs involved? Yeah, I, I uh, actually did an exercise. I computed the uh, storage time that would be equivalent to one minute at minus 20 at, uh, as a function of temperature as you near the glass transition. And I used assumptions that underestimate how long you could store. And it turns out that uh, dry ice temperature, you're only a few days. Um, minus 100, you're getting up to hundreds of years. And minus 120, you're already up to millennia. So you know, if you go below the glass transition temperature, even a small distance, you're, you're talking about geological time periods. So I think that it's probably possible, because it's almost been achieved, to get a, a human brain down to minus 140 if, if you mm -hmm. did the right kind of cooling procedure. And my calculations would indicate that you've got so much time at that that I could be off by, you know, 10,000 fold, and you're still going to have plenty of time uh, for nano to be developed. So I, I think that minus 140 is the target I would like to see achieved. Uh, at this moment, nobody knows how to get you there without a fracture, sure. but mm -hmm. there's one case in which one patient got to within a couple degrees of that temperature before they fractured. So I think it can be done. And uh, in the interim, minus 130 would probably be fine anyway. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have some choices to make. So Celsius. All right. Here's why I get to stick it to Ralph. <laughs> <laughs> Your slide yesterday was talking 20 years to molecular nanotechnology, right? Mm -hmm. And your slide today is talking being frozen for 100 years, right? Mm -hmm. And if I've got molecular nanotechnology, that rapidly, mm -hmm. if you have it pre-designed, all right, which, which is an open question, but if we use Peter's you know, fancy machines to do the design even before we have the ability to build them. Then once you get the first molecular assembler, you build them very, very fast. And you build a lot of them. That allows the construction of a matryoshka brain in the order of weeks. So we right. go from being a Kardashev type 1 civilization, actually pre-Kardashev type 1 civilization, to a Kardashev. Kardashev 1 means you get all the energy on the planet. 2 means you get all the energy from the star. And 3 takes a long time because you can't exceed the speed of light. That's all the energy of a galaxy. The transition time to a Matryoshka brain stage is on the order of a couple of weeks, depending upon what you want to dismantle. Now, the problem with that is, if that happens any time before your hundred years, then what you wake up into is going to be a matryoshka brainized solar system in which a majority of people, probably, because people are getting very comfortable with virtual reality, have decided, well, I'll just upload and live in virtual reality amongst the elements of a matryoshka brain, rather than hold on to this fragile body, which is being subjected to all of the hazards of living on a nice hazardous planet like Earth. So you said in this presentation, that is a good future. 
well, I think there's a substantial fraction of humanity that would not qualify that as a good future because the majority of humanity has not got their head around going from the this is me to the this is me, which you call the information you mm -hmm. know, transition. So how do you... Okay, so a couple of things going on. First off, the 100-year period, which I typically use when I'm talking about how long it will be, is actually a, an overly pessimistic F, uh, estimate. And I use that deliberately because most people are shocked at the idea that it could take as short a time as 100 years. Most people think it will take centuries and centuries. And when I pull it into 100 years, they go, ah, oh, well, you know, that's pushing it. If I start saying things like, I think we'll be reviving people in 40 or 50 years, they start saying, ah, I don't know if I believe that. So I simply leave it open and let people think about uh, for themselves what kind of time frame it might take. Certainly Alcor as an organization is set up so it's not critical. We will maintain people for as long as necessary.